Live from KSA 12. The six o'clock news starts right now. Some San Antonio area religious schools appear prepared to bring students back to campus weeks before their counterparts. Though San Antonio Metro Health has said no public or private schools may have children on campus for in person instruction until after Labor Day. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton has said such orders do not apply to religious schools. Our Garrett Berger found some local schools are ready to have kids back long before Labor Day. He joins us now live. Garrett. Well, parents here at St. Matthew's Catholic School received a letter today saying that they would have the option come August 17th whether their child returned to campus or continued to do remote learning. Right near the top of the letter, the principal for the school noted Ken Paxton's letter that exempts religious schools from local orders. Now, a spokesman for the Archdiocese told us today Catholic schools are prepared for both on and off campus scenarios for the start of class on August 17th. This past Friday, the same day as Metro Health's directive and Ken Paxton's letter, the superintendent of Catholic schools wrote in a letter to families that each school has worked to customize its own plans. She also mentioned that they've heard comments from parents taking their threatening to take their kids to public school because of the tuition if they're remote learning. Meanwhile, another religious school system definitely plans to have its, chi its children back in class. On August the 17th, Cornerstone Christian Schools will be open with children attending class on campus in their classrooms. Cornerstone Christian Schools posting that video on its Facebook page this past Monday. The far northwest side school has students from pre-K through high school. Calls to them requesting information were not returned before airtime, so we don't have details on their plans. It's not so clear what others might do either. Over at the San Antonio Christian School, staff told us its board had met last night and they were working on a plan that they hope to get out to parents this week. However, they wouldn't tell us which way they were leaning with those plans. Now, we did reach out to Metro Health to ask them what they plan to do if religious schools like this one go ahead in violation of the city, city health department's order. Now, so far, we have not received a response from, or direct answer from them. A spokeswoman for Metro Health saying they need to check with the city attorney's office first. Live at a probably soon to be open school, I'm Gary Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. Comal County reporting six new deaths today related to the coronavirus as cases there continue to surge. All those who died were residents of assisted living facilities in New Braunfels. One of the victims, a man in his 80s at Sodalis Senior Living, died back on July 11th. His death reported to the Office of Public Health this week. Three women ages 60, from 60s to 80s died at Colonial Manor. A man in his 90s died at Kirkwood Manor. And a woman in her 70s from Kirkwood Manor died at a hospital. That brings the death toll to 43 in Comal County. There are now 1,804 COVID-19 cases in that county, which includes confirmed and probable cases. In today's KSAP Q&A, we are joined by Governor Greg Abbott live from Austin. And Governor, thanks for being with us today. Uh, I think that we know that sure. preventing the spread, of course, continues to be a top priority. But for families across this state, um, school is top of mind right now. How to educate students both safely, keep them engaged safely, also families continuing to focus on their jobs and provide for their families. So what's your message to parents and teachers who are looking to the state for some flexibility in school districts and for some solutions. You used the key word and that is flexibility. So uh, the Texas Education Agency has been uh, working with uh, the school leaders across the entire state of Texas and uh, last week laid out a plan that focused on putting the health and safety of students, parents and teachers first uh, and making sure that is achieved by giving local school districts the flexibility they need uh, to make sure that uh, school can take place in a classroom setting with schools uh, open to students and teachers if that is possible, but where it's not possible, making sure uh, that distance learning will be achievable in a very uh, effective way uh, by empowering uh, both the teachers as well as the, as the students to have the equipment they need so that distance learning can be effective for students when that is going to be needed to ensure the safety of the students and teachers. Governor, what are you seeing in the numbers right now of COVID cases in our state? Are you seeing any improvement or are you taking it's going to get worse before it gets better kind of attitude at this point? 
So, with the, and, and listen, th this is very important because not only have I seen levels of improvement, but there's a study that came out from the University of North Texas uh, saying that in the aftermath of the mask requirement that people wear some type of face covering, there has been a reduction in the number of people testing positive. We are seeing improved numbers, both with regard to those testing positive, as well as uh, in some areas, the hospitalization rates. However, I have to emphasize, even though there may be glimmers of improvements taking place, people cannot think that COVID either has or is leaving as it is not leaving anytime soon. The only thing this points out is that there are improvements coming as a result of more people adopting this practice of wearing face masks, staying at home at all possible. But if you do go out, keep your distance from others. And there was a letter sent to your office from the Texas Public Interest Research Group signed by doctors from across uh, this country, different universities, urging you to put in place another shutdown. Is there any circumstances under which you see that actually happening right now? So what, what doctors have recommended uh, at the national level, uh, at the local level, at the state level, uh, and that is uh, that if everyone will adopt this practice of wearing a face mask when you go out, there will not be a need to sh shut down. That's exactly uh, one of the outcomes of that study done by the University of Texas, uh, University of North Texas Health Science Center, that said that a shutdown will not be required. It be, if people do adopt this practice of wearing a face guard. And so we need to make sure we have enough time for this practice uh, to be utilized by everybody in the state, whether you're in San Antonio or elsewhere. It is time to begin the practice of adopting wearing a face mask whenever you go out, as well as if you don't need to go out, just stay at home. We've talked, of course, you know, County Judge Nelson Wolf and Mayor Ron Nuremberg have asked that more local authority be given so they can maybe take some different precautions and different things. And obviously what happens in San Antonio is going to be totally different than what happens, let's say, in Tyler. I mean, it's a huge state. Have you considered giving more authority back to local governments to decide what they should do to fight this coronavirus? So I, I have returned an, a, a large amount of authority uh, to local officials. Uh, and there was a story that came up in Austin yesterday that I think is true for San Antonio also. Uh, and that is in Austin, there have been zero citations issued for people not wearing face masks. The same thing applies in San Antonio and Bear County. They have authority to enforce all of these protocols that are safe protocols so that people, if they go out to a restaurant, they are limited to a certain capacity. Uh, when they go into stores, they are limited to a certain capacity. And they have total authority to enforce all of those rules. And so what they need to begin to do is to use the tools and people they have to make sure that the current strategies are enforced. That way we can contain the spread of COVID-19 without forcing people into poverty. And you mentioned you mentioned that, Governor, families, businesses, they're still dealing with the fallout from the economic fallout from the shutdown, from businesses being uh, forced to limit their capacity right now. We heard from the state comptroller earlier this week that there will be an eleven and a half billion dollar shortfall in the current two year budget for the state. What does the effect of that look like right now for Texans? Listen, it's meaningful that the state will face a budget shortfall, but I'm candidly more concerned about the budget shortfalls that families watching the show right now are facing because of shutdowns. And that's, that's why uh, I'm, I'm working every single day to try to make sure that your viewers are going to be able to earn the paycheck they need to pay their rent and pay their bills, while at the very same time making sure we have the safest practices in place to make sure they do not contract COVID-19. Governor Greg Abbott, live from Austin, as always. We appreciate your time, Governor. Thank you. Thank you all. All right, let's check out Trans Guide right now before we head to weather. And we're actually looking at 410 at Jackson Keller, where things are moving along very smoothly, maybe a little busier than we've seen in some recent days. I know it's it's been smooth sailing out there, but at least it is now as well. All right, look outside with live cam right now. It is 99 degrees, awfully close to that triple digit mark. Yeah, another day very close to triple digits, but not quite there. And obviously we need some rainfall. The aquifer down about another half a foot today, and the 10-day average is 655.1. That 10-day average is important because once it's 650, 
that's when stage two restrictions take effect. And taking a look at the radar, we have a decent amount of activity in a little area of the Hill Country. We're talking Edwards County, Real County, and that western corner of Kerr County. That activity should be coming to an end as we lose our daytime heating. Other parts of the state, some rainfall out there, especially East Texas and up near Lubbock as well. But the main focus is this area of active weather over the eastern Gulf of Mexico. It's starting to come together a little bit more, becoming a little more organized. It's a broad area of low pressure. I think odds favor it getting a title of tropical depression later tonight or tomorrow morning, maybe even tropical storm. That would be Hannah. However, regardless of title, the way it looks right now, the impact would be the same for us. And that would be some areas of good rain across parts of South Texas. For our area, that favors Saturday, Sunday time frame. And then once the system gets a little more organized, we'll be able to predict it better and be able to really hone in on how much rain and where and who could either see a lot of rain and who could see really no rain. The possibilities are there for all of South Texas, so we will have better information. But right now, Saturday, Sunday, equal chances of those scattered showers, some of which could be some good soakers. High temperatures, upper 90s the next couple of days, a little closer to 90 with those better rain chances this weekend. We'll be right back. It is time now for today's daily briefing on coronavirus cases here locally in Bear County in San Antonio. Let's listen in. San Antonio and Dr. Brian Alsip, who is the chief medical officer of the University Health System. This is our update of COVID-19 in San Antonio. Tonight, we are reporting 1,688 new cases of COVID-19, which brings our total to 33,555 in our community. Keep in mind, these daily case totals are just one thing that we are tracking. You can review more information about overall positivity rate, hospital trends, and onset of illness at EpiCurve at covid19.sanantonio.gov. But I did want to point out one thing. In the five days prior to today, ending today, we are averaging over 1,200 cases a day. The previous five days, we were right around 600 per day. So clearly we are seeing a surge as a result of that time period right around July 4th. Keep that in mind because that all goes back to how we handle the behavior and how we, we handle uh, physical distancing and masking. Uh, we also unfortunately have nine new deaths to report tonight, bringing the total to 283. One is associated with a nursing home. Uh, they are as follows, eight Hispanic males in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 90s, and one white male in his 80s. It should be noted that tonight we are reporting two deaths in their 30s and one death in their 20s. Uh, we continue to mourn the loss of these members of our community, loved ones, neighbors, colleagues, so please keep their friends and their family in your prayers. Over in our hospitals, tonight we're reporting 1,113 people in the hospital with 429 in ICU and 287 on ventilators. Those are all down from yesterday, which is a good sign. There are 51% of ventilators available and 12% of hospital beds available, and our hospital system, again, remains under severe stress. Let's put some of these numbers in perspective, though. Uh, the graphic you see on the screen is a snapshot of overall hospitalizations. Of the overall cases that were hospitalized, the 0 through 19 age group is made up of, of average of 5% of overall patients in the hospital. Of those age group, 36% of hospitalized cases are among infants ages 0 to 2. So this goes to show you again, no age group is immune from this virus. So please do not risk the life of another person, whether elderly or young, by not following the guidance of our public health professionals. Wear a mask, wash your hands, keep six feet of distance between yourself and others. And a loved one, in many cases a child, is depending on you to keep them safe. One last thing before I turn it over to the judge. I did talk about the SG2 model yesterday, so I'd put that uh, graph on the screen. SG2 is a company that produces a model showing projected hospitalizations over the next few weeks. On this graphic, you'll see the black line shows where we actually are with regard to hospitalizations over time. The blue line will show you the projections 
if the public protected themselves by wearing masks and physically distancing over the 4th of July. We know that that wasn't the case universally. So that would have been our best case scenario. If you look at the green bar, it projects hospitalizations if people exercise no precautions over the 4th of July. So as we move along over the next few days, we think we're going to be somewhere in between that blue and green line. But certainly we are hoping that this plateau remains and begins to decline. And it all depends on how we handle the next few weeks in terms of masking, physical distancing, and personal hygiene. So please do your part. I'll turn it over now to Judge Wolf. Yeah, you're, you're correct, Mayor. Uh, we have a chance to finally get hold of this thing uh, if we'll hold together and do the right thing. Um, we hit a high point on hospitalizations on uh, July the 13th with 1,267 in the hospital. And in the last 11 days, we've seen a small decline, but not enough to really determine whether we're turning the corner or not. But we've had about a 154 decline in people going in the hospital. Good, but again, too early. But the bad part of that is that we are not uh, declining in terms of um, people that are on ventilators and people that are in ICU. Maybe a tiny bit of difference, but that's still very high. And those patients are very much at risk. And uh, we, we hope they're going to recover. But I think there's a couple things we need to remember now. Um, people used to make light of this. And it used to just really irritate me when they say this is no different than the flu. Well, the bottom line is COVID is a lot more deadly than the flu. And it's much, much more contagious and passes very, very quickly uh, the way it stands today on average of about a thousand people that would pick it up, 10 of those will pass away. So the, so, so it's, it's still a lot, a, a lot of people that will pass away. But more important than that, uh, in, in, in thinking about how we need to handle this, is that if you had COVID, and particularly if you ended up in the hospital, and particularly if you ended up in um, ICU or on a ventilator, uh, when you come out, the game is not over. There's some long-term health consequences of having COVID. We don't talk about that a lot. People, oh, well, there are not many people dying. What are we worried about? That's a terrible, terrible thing to be saying because there's a lot more danger to you and long-term health uh, issues uh, with respect to this disease. So, as the mayor says, we've got a chance to turn the corner here, but everybody's going to have to be very careful doing the things the mayor said, face masks, distancing, sanitation, and staying away from large groups. Uh, I think I gave the figure just last night. You go with 100 people somewhere, it's almost certain one of them will have it. You go to, with 10 people, some, almost certain about 30% will have it. So stay away from large crowds and do all the things that we've suggested you do and help us turn this around. Uh, some promising signs, but very little data yet to know whether we've done it. Thank you, Judge. And we don't hear it as often, but it's still true. Uh, we are all in this together. So let's keep working hard, physical distance, wear a mask, personal hygiene, stay away from the large crowds, stay home when you can, and we can, we can turn the corner on this virus. As always, you can check the latest updates by texting COSAGOV to 55000. You can also go to the website anytime at covid19.sanantonio.gov. All right, those are the latest numbers from the city and the county. Nine new deaths to report in the last 24 hours. That brings our total to 283. But the big thing that the mayor pointed out, two of those deaths, two of the nine were people in their 30s. One of the nine was in his 20s. So that gives you some perspective on the fact that we are seeing younger people get sick from coronavirus and pass away. 1,688 the count over the last 24 hours of people testing positive. And the mayor said that we are experiencing a surge linked back to the July 4th holiday weekend. He said the last five days we've seen on average about 1,200 new cases a day. Prior to that, the average was about 600 new cases a day. We have seen a drop in hospitalization since July 13th. That's something uh, that the county judge noted. It has been a small decline. So they were saying today that it's not significant enough to really say that we are uh, improving substantially, but it is 
is good news that that number, that hospitalization number, that official after official has told us is the true indicator of the severity of this illness in Bear County. That number is going down, however slightly. Yeah, and we saw the graph of the prognostications of how long this would last. It looks like right now, according to that graph, we're in the middle of a plateau. That pl plateau could continue or get worse or get better, depending on whether people wear their mask. And right now, it looks like the decline either way is set for around middle, early August for before we start seeing some of these numbers go down. And that seems to be consistent again with uh, the different uh, prognostications, as we have heard from various yep. officials on this newscast. We'll be right back. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. There will be no preseason games in the NFL this season. That's according to the NFL Players Association that told us players the league has agreed to cancel all preseason games in 2020 to give players more time to acclimate to play regular season games in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. The league owners had won at least two preseason games after they agreed to cancel games one and four in the exhibition season already, but the players wanted none, especially when you consider how training camps got off to such a rocky start with no health and safety protocols in place until the day rookies were to report for the Houston Texans and Kansas City Chiefs camps on Monday. And still there's a lot of work to do about financial compensation for players who want to opt out due to the coronavirus. Training camp rosters will also be reduced from 90 to 80 players. The Dallas Cowboys telling us today there will be no access to in-person player interviews during the 2020 training camp that has now been moved to their headquarters in Frisco instead of the California camp where the state is also a hot spot for the coronavirus and no access to daily workouts. Remember, Texas is also a hot spot for the coronavirus and the league is trying to assure there is going to be a season barring outbreaks of COVID-19 in training camps. Now that the UIL has come down with their decision to delay the start of the high school football season in Texas until September the 24th for teams in the larger 5A and 6A districts, most coaches we have talked to are encouraged that there will be a high school football season despite the fact Texas coronavirus cases continue to rise this late in the summer. This means more to Willie Hall than just about any coach in the state today since he is retiring at the end of the school year after 37 years at Brackenridge and 25 as Eagles head coach. But what is remarkable about this man who would like to have one last season before he calls it a career, he still puts his players and students first. I'd love to have a season, but uh, you got to be precautionary with what's going on nowadays. So safety first, and if we get to have a season, that would be great. I mean, if if things clear up enough to where we can have one in this, and we have the safety factor that we're 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 looking to have that uh, it'd be great. I mean, I'm looking forward to it. Workouts for 5A and 6A schools can't begin until September the 7th, and playoffs will be extended into January to assure a full season for schools in 1A to 4A, all is normal, so to speak, with workouts beginning August the 3rd and games August the 27th. The University of the Incarnate Word Cardinals football team was supposed to be back on the field starting Monday, but due to the soaring coronavirus cases in Bear County, that has not happened yet. The Southland Conference held their annual media day today, albeit virtually with Commissioner Tom Burnett telling us he is determined to play a 2020 football schedule this fall. The Cardinals will be one of the first on that schedule with an opener plan for Thursday night, September the 3rd at Northwestern State. Right now, head coach Eric Morris, who's about to start his third season on the UIW campus, would just like to be happy to see his players in person. More so than football, I'm excited to get our kids back together under one roof, um, to be able to have a little bit of normalcy in our life, to be able to interact with them, to continue to, to lead this program without Zoom. Um, I'm, I'm Zoomed out right now. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of it. I'm ready to have um, face to face and uh, interaction with these kids. So more so than, than anything, I'm ready to get them back, get them working out and, and pushing towards a great season. Hopefully soon. And I want an office like that. Yeah. I was going to say, is that a real background or is it a virtual? No, I think that's an actual, you know, so sure. nice setup. I, well, I, I, it looks to me like it's yeah. actual. I also, if it is, I want that office. I also <laughs> agree with the head coach that I am also Zoomed out. I have too yeah. many Zoom meetings yeah. so far for me, no too. Verb. Yeah. Zoomed out. Yes. Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. New at six, fighting back against violence. District 2 Councilwoman Jada Andrew Sullivan announcing a new partnership with several local nonprofit organizations in the area. It's a joint effort to help support parents who've lost kids to violence. 
and provide kids with constructive activities that can redirect anger and frustrations that often continue the cycle of violence. The initiative is going to be called Roots of Royalty. Devin Clark explains what it entails and when it begins. We had a young man get shot at a hundred times and he is fighting for his life as we speak right now. The stories are painfully similar. Uh, I had an 11 year old uh, cousin that got shot last month and in, um, it really affected him real bad. A handful of uh, relatives um, had, that have lost their lives to um, gun violence. These community leaders say they're fed up. Enough is enough. We're not going to bury no more kids. Now teaming up with District 2 Councilwoman Jada Andrew Sullivan for the Roots of Royalty initiative. We're bridging this as a learning and entrepreneurship training program. And it will include a boy summit as well. Other parts of the effort include support for grieving parents. To um, restore them, rebuild them, and redirect their past. And outreach by those who've survived gun violence. Be a voice. You know, turn your uh, situation into a, a testimony that could help other people. Andrew Sullivan is hoping to get budget approval for the program, but if not, she says she'll reach out to community partners to fund it. Whether that's Boeing, whether that's um, Velocity Texas, whether that's Spurs Gives, if that's Coca-Cola, even if it's our neighborhood um, associations. We need everyone that is gonna come to the table. Because of the pandemic, Andrew Sullivan says that Roots of Royalty will kick off with virtual sessions and it's slated to begin in November. For more information, you can contact the District 2 Council Office at 210-207-7278 or visit ksat.com for more information. Reporting on the east side, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. The coronavirus has forced families into some tight quarters for months now. And while that togetherness can be great, it's also come with an unexpected repercussion, accidental poisonings. Young kids have been spending longer days at home and they're in closer proximity to more dangerous cleaning solutions that are meant to keep us safe from COVID-19. Ursula Perry shows us what the latest numbers from the South Texas Poison Center reveal. We're into disinfecting and cleaning this year more than ever, and that has created added danger to kids. Take hand sanitizers. There have been 934 calls to the center in 2012 already for accidental poisonings. That's a 70% increase from 2019. It makes sense. This product can now be found everywhere, and it's toxic if swallowed. The same is true of bleach. It looks like simple water, but it could kill you if you drink it. There were more than 1,100 calls to the Poison Control Center in 2019 for accidental bleach poisoning inquiries. This year, it's spiking at a whopping 1,800 cases already in 2020, a 57% increase. But the biggie was disinfectant. There were 258 calls in 2019 for accidental poisoning involving disinfectants. But in 2020, the year of the coronavirus, there was a 157% jump in calls. One reason is that many disinfectants come in bottles that resemble fruit juice or come in colors that might make a child assume it's sweet, like Kool-Aid. For example, which is the apple juice and which is the pine sol? If you chose this, it could kill you. Also, look how similar in color this Windex is to Blue Gatorade. It really does require you to take a whole new look at your housekeeping. Tomorrow at 6, we're going to talk to an injury prevention specialist about other things that could be mistaken by kids and how you can avoid getting them hurt. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. All right, close, but not quite to 100 today. But how close are we to those rain chances? Yeah, that's what I really want to know. Let's bring on the rain, Adam. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be nice to see some good rain around here, and our best potential still is this upcoming weekend, and that's with that tropical moisture that's over the Gulf of Mexico. Next couple of days, same old. A few isolated pop-up stray showers, brief thunderstorms here and there. Only about 10 to 20% of our area will actually get it. Then we get into the weekend, and we boost those chances up to 60%, but we will be fine-tuning these numbers because as the system comes together, more we'll have better information and be able to uh, fine tune that forecast. So let's take a look at the radar right now. And there's some activity mainly in the hill country. Edwards County again, just like yesterday, seen some decent little pockets of rainfall. Also parts of Real County and Western Kerr County. At least somebody's getting a little bit of rain out there right now. It's not a whole lot, but it's better than nothing. The rest of us a good amount of sunshine. 
across the state. Some other areas of rain uh, East Texas. You get up near Lubbock, San Angelo areas. At least they're getting in on some good showers. The better rainfall potential is out over the Gulf of Mexico. That's this area of active weather, basically a broad area of low pressure that's likely to develop into our next tropical system, likely to become a tropical depression either later tonight or tomorrow morning, and maybe even tropical storm Hannah. But the key is with this, the way it looks right now, whether or not it has a title of tropical depression or tropical storm or nothing, the impact looks the same, and that would be rainfall with some pockets of heavy rain in parts of South Texas. The big question is exactly where and when. And actually the hurricane hunters are out there. They've been looking at this system, trying to find the exact center of circulation, trying to gather more information so we can answer some of those questions. Latest model indications show this area of active weather pushing westward and making it to the Texas coastline at some point this weekend. Right now we've got equal chances for rain Saturday, Sunday, but I do think in the end, as we near Saturday and Sunday, one day we'll start to see better chances than the other. All right, so again, regardless of title, right now impacts look the same, and that looks to be some rain, which could be too much of a good thing for some parts of Central or South Texas. 99 was our high today. That's four degrees above average. We made it to, well, right now we're 100 in Del Rio. We were over 100 just a few hours ago. Laredo at 100 degrees and Good portion of South Texas well into the 90s. So 10% chance of rain tomorrow. Maybe a stray isolated shower. That would be it. up near 100 again. Same story as we get into Friday. Then Saturday, Sunday, we increase those rain chances. The big question is exactly where and how much rain is going to fall. And then, of course, the timing with it as well. So we will definitely be fine tuning this forecast. The thing is, with these systems, once they become better organized, they become, well, I don't want to say easier, but they're not as complicated to forecast and fine tune those little details. So it takes a little bit of time. Either way, the impact looks to be mainly just rain. It's a matter of how much and how long is it going to last? Yeah, we just like it's in the forecast. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Adam. We hope to have Mayor Rod Nuremberg after the break. New at 6, an old warehouse on the near west side coming down to make way for new housing. The Tampico Apartments are said to be the first such investment there in years. 200 units will be built at I-35 in Tampico. Jesse DeGriato tells us the project will provide some of the affordable housing that's critically needed on the west side. The colorful Bienvenidos to San Antonio's west side apparently works. A warehouse is being demolished to make way for the West Side's first major investment in years. This is what the doctor ordered for our progress in San Antonio. Former Mayor Henry Cisneros, who still lives on the West Side, is one of the developers in partnership with the San Antonio Housing Authority, building Tampico Apartments at a cost of $33 million. Brand new housing that's going to give them the amenities they don't have. Especially here at Alasana Pache Courts, the city's oldest public housing project. If residents were to move ahead of its planned demolition and redevelopment, could they afford Tampico apartments? Thanks to vouchers tenants are given. So those clients can move to that property without feeling that pressure of the rent escalating. On its low end, affordable units will start at $324, up to over $1,500 for those that are market price, those that could appeal to the expected influx of professors and students when the UTSA downtown campus is expanded. That's Another concern, mi barrio no se vende, my neighborhood isn't for sale, is a message not lost on the former mayor. We want new investment, but we don't want it at the expense of the people who've been here. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Time now for another edition of KSAT Q&A. Today we are joined by Mayor Ron Nirenberg, as we are every Wednesday, to talk about the very latest in COVID-19 here locally. Mayor, thanks for being with us. I want to start talking about schools, if we can. We talked about earlier in this show how some religious schools in San Antonio, they're preparing to open their doors to in-class learning prior to Labor Day, and that goes against what Metro Health has tried to put in place. So do you have any idea what the city's response, Metro Health's response, is going to be uh, in determining when those schools could start? 
You know, the public health guidance and the local public health authority, which is given, um, you know, the authority to um, deal with this issue is really making decisions based on public health. And that's the way it should be. So the directive is for public and private schools and should be heated that way. So, uh, you know, th these, again, are not made uh, through anything other than what can keep our community healthy and safe. And she has made that determination that the best thing to do for our public schools and our private schools is for them to open uh, in person only after Labor Day. But how does that balance with what uh, Attorney General Ken Paxton said, that religious schools uh, don't have to abide by the after Labor Day guidance? You know, as I've said before, uh, the Attorney General really has just caused a lot of confusion and has put uh, you know, has, uh, has put out these statements that really uh, detract from what public health professionals and medical experts are telling us to keep people safe and healthy. You keep in mind, back in, in April, uh, when we had a mask order in place that was protecting the public and has been shown to really stop this uh, turn around, the surge that we're seeing, it was saving lives, the attorney general put out a letter saying that we couldn't do that. The governor had to reverse that and, and put the order in place, both allow us to do that locally through businesses as well as statewide now. So if our interest is in saving lives and keeping people, keeping people healthy in our community, we would be best to ignore the political messaging of the attorney general. But the reality is there are a lot of schools that say they're not going to do that. Cornerstone says they're going to open, you know, like they normally would. I mean, there are a lot of schools that say they're going to be open despite what Metro Health says. So what's yeah, the reality again, on the ground? We're, we're going to issue uh, the guidance and, you know, again, ensuring that we are doing so based on the public health guidance alone and not based on anything else. And, you know, it doesn't matter what classification of the school is. If our interest is in keeping people healthy, our public health director, our, our local public health authority, has issued the directive that public and private schools ought to remain closed for in-person schooling until after Labor Day. It's, it's clearly in the science of what we're looking at for stopping this pandemic and keeping our kids, our teachers, our parents, the community healthy. Mayor, we're going to continue our conversation on the other side of this break. Stay with us. We are continuing our Q&A with Mayor Ron Nirenberg. And Mayor, we want to be as clear as possible about schools uh, starting, religious schools, sure. private schools yeah. starting. Can Metro Health put in place any kind of penalties or actually prevent private schools from beginning in-person learning prior to Labor Day? You know, that's, that's still a little unclear given the, the mass confusion that our Attorney General is trying to create. But we will certainly have some clarification of that from our city attorney. But, but again, I would appeal to people's sensibilities here. We see hundreds of people dying in our community on, on now uh, since July. Uh, we see thousands of infections that are occurring. We see how it's affecting all ages, including those infants that we talked about at the briefing today. No one is immune from this virus. The public health authority is simply looking at the medical evidence and what can keep our community safe, including your children, our teachers, the parents, all those folks that depend on that school. If our interest is in protecting those people's lives and their health, we would pay attention to what our medical directors are saying, not elected politicians who have been routinely trying to score political points on this pandemic. And what Dr. Wu is saying is that we simply need to adhere to the guidance and, and keep this under control by not having in-person schooling until after Labor Day. You know, again, a traditional time for when schools used to start. Uh, but this is, uh, again, in the, in, the, in the best guidance to keep our community healthy and safe. I want to make a, a transition now because we talked to Governor Abbott earlier in this show, and I asked him about the fact that both you and the county judge have asked for more local authority. We're seeing counties, Hidalgo, I believe the most recent, that have had a stay-home order issued. Yeah. If you had the authority, would you do something like Hidalgo and I believe Nueces County has done where they've asked people to stay home because of the surging numbers? You know, the challenge for us is that uh, these orders are not enforceable. When the governor has explicitly uh, pulled that kind of enforceability out of our ordinances, if we go beyond what the state has required or what the state has mandated, 
But what the public health professionals are telling us is that there's no smoking gun here. We can't simply look at one particular business or one particular activity and say, shut it down and then the pandemic goes away. We have to change our behaviors. Number one, we have to eliminate mass gatherings. So one of the things that we're talking to the governor about is that we have to eliminate all those exceptions from mass gathering rules that are in the state's orders. We need that to happen. We also are grateful for the rollback and some of the activities that uh, contribute to large congregation indoors. That has to be prohibited. We have to continue to wearing to wear masks and physical distance. And most importantly, don't let your guard down. If you're not part of a household, then you shouldn't be gathering. Not right now when the virus is so uh, prevalent out there. We all got to do our parts. But, you know, we have to focus on those individual behaviors that will begin to see the um, the virus load and the spread of this virus uh, begin to wane. Mayor Ron Nirenberg, as always, thanks for being with us today. We'll see you on the night beat Thank at you. 10. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We'll be right back. More of the same the next couple of days through Friday, then into the weekend. We boost those rain chances a bit. Still a lot of uncertainty surrounding the exact timing and uh, how much rain and where, but we'll keep you updated and we'll be uh, fine tuning those details in the days ahead. All right. Thanks, Adam. And thanks for watching the news at six. We'll see you tonight on the night beat at 10.